<clears throat> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, The Nuts and Bolts to Starting a Glass Recycling Program in a Rural Area. My name is Mary Ann Ray Molador. I'm the Assistant Director of the Northeast Recycling Council, uh, which is also known as NERC, and I'll be facilitating uh, the webinar. We have two presenters from regional recycling centers in Maine who will share their experience of how they started and are implementing their glass recycling programs. Our presenters are Michael Berry, who is a board member and treasurer of the Unity Area Regional Recycling Center, and Ray Hebert, who is the supervisor of the North Aroostook Solid Waste Association's Regional Recycling Center in Eagle Lake, Maine. Um, I have been working with both of these regional recycling centers with a grant from USDA to help them both source their um, end markets for their glass and to troubleshoot and provide technical assistance about um, the various stages of setting up their glass recycling programs. So I'm excited uh, that both of them are able to join us today and to share their stories. Michael, I'd like to ask you to start by telling us about what you all are doing at, at Unity. Well, we have eight member towns and there's a population of 8,447 people in these eight towns. And we were accepting glass I'd say until 2019 and our market or our vendor cut us off from shipping any more glass because of not our, necessarily our contamination, but contamination that they were getting in and they just didn't, they shut everybody off. And we had some towns, two towns that threatened to pull out because they, they were upset that we did, weren't able to take glass and we, we immediately started looking for ways to, to accept it. And when we found the, the glass crusher that we've purchased, we applied for a main DEP grant for just help with buying the machine. And since then, I mean, we, we started taking the glass March 1st of 2021 and since then we've crushed 16 tons and we've got another ton and a half just waiting to be crushed. They just haven't gotten to doing that crushing yet. Um, but it's, you know, our towns want to recycle as much product as they can. It's not, it's never a question of, you know, how much return is on it. It's just, wanting to recycle products and I mean all the products that we take we don't charge anybody for any of the products at the facility it's all done through taxation between the towns um Michael would you mind if I shared my screen and showed a picture of your uh facility go right ahead So in this picture on the lower right-hand side, there's it's just below a fan and that, that is the whole glass crusher. And it is, it is a very small machine and each piece has to get inserted one at a time. And it, the ton and a half that we have sitting on the floor right now that needs to be crushed they felt was a two day process right now. But if you look at the, the lower right hand picture, that is a picture of the sand. And, and as soon as it goes through the machine, you can, you can literally filter it right through your hands, fill um, fingers, you know, you, you can rub it on your hands. There is no sharp pieces to it whatsoever.
I mean, there, there's been a few small problems we've had with the machine, but it's most of it's just been wear and tear. And our com our distributor has worked with us very well to um, make it work. You know, get us the parts. Michael, can you talk a little bit about? why you decided to crush instead of collecting whole bottles? Well, we didn't have any way to get rid of it. And the glass crusher just seemed the most um, space efficient way to, to be able to accept glass. What's that crusher cost? I want to say it was around seven thousand dollars just for the crusher, and then we couldn't have gotten much further away from our electrical panels. I'd say with the purchase of the crusher, the fan, and the electrical, we were probably either side of ten thousand dollars. Yeah. And that's one piece at a time. That is one piece at a time. Yeah. Having to, you know, they are hand loaded into the machine. That's quite a bit of labor then, huh? It is. And we are currently in the process of looking for a, a larger glass crusher, something that's going to be less labor intensive. This particular unit in the sales flyer, you know, looking back is hindsight's 2020, but this glass crusher is really intended for bars and wineries that, okay, yeah. you know, they're only handling a few bottles at a time and it, and bars and wineries in Maine don't, wouldn't want to purchase this machine anyway, because of our bottle bill. Right. Well, um, looking at John's notes here, if if we go whole, he says it would take too much room, but that's what he'd like to have is a crusher. And but we're still uh, trying to get the public to uh, to recycle glass. There's not not too too much of it right now, but uh, we could have some better signing and all that, and uh, b better storage containers and <clears throat> to get them to get started. The people that are bring, bringing some in, all their glasses clean, which is great, but we need more advertisement up, at, up there at the uh, transfer station. Yeah, I mean, some, some of it's just getting the word out. And we just, I, I didn't realize it until, you know, talking with Marianne, you know, it, but I've always lived in this area. We live in a very unique area where everybody just wants to recycle. You know, when towns are getting upset because we, we stopped accepting certain products, but we didn't just stop accepting them because we didn't want to. When the market gets cut off, you know, there isn't a whole lot you can do about it. And when your facility is only so large, it's not like we can sit on, when we have two trailer loads of bailed products sitting on the floor, things are starting to get tight. So yeah. to sit on a product for an undetermined amount of time, it is just, it's not doable. We don't have any outside storage. So it's, you know, our towns want to recycle as much as we can. I mean, we recycle all forms of batteries, light bulbs, any type of light bulb, electronics. Fluorescent bulbs? Fluorescent, fluorescent bulbs? Yes, fluorescent bulbs. Really? Yep. And we, we work with a company named Veolia, and they ship us boxes for free. Well, I got the boxes too, but yeah. Uh, let's see. We don't charge people at the facility so that we're not 
the thought is the lower, you know, if people who, who might want to recycle don't have enough money, you know, to, are, are we going to spend $15 to get rid of a, a computer monitor versus putting it in the trash? And we want to encourage people to recycle as much as they can so we don't charge anything for, we don't charge any of our resident members for any product. It's just whatever our budget is minus our sales credit and our sales credit's what we get throughout the year for product we've mailed. And we subtract that from the budget and the, you know, if we had say an $84,447 budget, each town, each member in each town would essentially pay one dollar. Right. The thing is about the glasses, we used to uh, throw it in the uh, the trash. Right. There's a lot. There's a lot of weight we're trying to save to, uh, collecting the glass. A lot of tonnage. Yes, I mean we we have a spot out behind our facility that we're looking to dump the glass so that we can create a level pad or a flat pad before we add gravel to it. And we just haven't started that process yet. We have 17, there's 16 pallets of crushed glass and each pallet has four barrels on it. Yeah. We're trying to build a little uh, concrete uh, bay to put the glass in. Right. And, uh, a, a covered tarp over it. That's that's that was one of our plans, but it hasn't happened yet. But the money is kind of tight here, so we'll wait and see what happens. Michael, can right. you talk about your end markets for the glass? Well, one of the avenues we've tried going through is uh, there's a facility that there's a company that's building a facility in Maine. They're they want to use glass for insulating and for boxes for um, lithium batteries so that if there was a lithium battery leak, that it would, the glass would extinguish the fire. Oh, it's a fire suppression box. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we are, we're trying to, we've had some contact with them. We've sent them a couple samples but we haven't heard anything, whether it's been staffing changeovers or just people on vacation. We're not sure exactly why we haven't heard back from them. Right. How long ago did you send that presentation? Oh, we, we sent one sample probably in April or May of last year. And then we sent another one September, October of last year as well. And no response yet? No response. You know, mm -hmm. we've got some people who have talked that they want to try to use the glass in lieu of it added the glass to sand for when they sand the roads during the wintertime or use it as a, a fill for what, uh, what, would glass, what, would, what would glass do of sanding a road? It really, I don't know that it's going to do anything. It just makes the sand go further. You oh, know, okay. it, I don't know that it's, I don't know exactly what it's going to do. Yeah. Well, around here, they don't use sand anymore. It's salt and calcium. The state around here, only the state uses pure salt. And the towns usually do a sand salt mix. Yeah. Sometimes we do, you, you, we, you, I used to work with the state. We did use a sand salt mix for quite a while, but about uh, 15, 16 years ago, we went mainly to salt. Then after a while, they added the calcium to it, but I don't know where the glass would help that. Yeah, um, I don't really, I don't see where it would be good for sanding roads, but as far as if you're installing a culvert and you needed, you know, fill, 
I see it being good for that. Um, one of our employees took some sand home and he filled holes and through the winter, he said the glass, the, the glass doesn't hold water and therefore it didn't freeze. So he was able to move the salt, the glass around if he needed, wanted to during the winter. Yeah. It might be good to uh, mix it with the uh, asphalt when they bathe. Well, that would be a great, great spot to put it. It's just convincing other companies to use it. Yeah. Well, as far as John's nose, let's see. Go ahead, Ray. Why don't you uh, tell us about what's happening at your recycling center? About what? The glass recycling. Oh, right now we're, we got a few, maybe a dozen people bring some in. Uh, not much. I probably got. I probably got a ton and a half there in barrels. Uh, but it gets so mixed up, people don't know where to put it. So we got to help them out all the time. I need some better containers with uh, bigger, bigger size to put on the barrels to where the stuff goes, like uh, plastic, uh, glass, uh, cardboard, and all that. But he's got some little signs here. He, he laminates them, but they're not big enough. Is there any way you can help us out with signs? Yeah, um, we actually did provide you all with a A-frame sign um, and the A-frame itself. So you should have that. And we did provide the designs for signs to John, um, which can be used. Good. Last time you were here, you asked me to move a sign for the glass. I moved that and it helped a little bit, but the sign's not quite big enough. Yeah. Yeah. So, John, just, I mean, Ray, put it into perspective a little bit. How many towns do you all serve and about how many residents? We have five towns and uh, the population of those towns is uh, during the winter is 2000, about 2125. In the summer, uh, more out staters come in. We got about twenty five hundred. So, and I can tell everyone that the Eagle Lake area feels, even when you're driving through, it, it's a extremely rural air part of Maine. Right, yeah. we're close to the uh, Canadian border. Right. Um, you see more trees than anything where um, it's different than Michael's area, which is more populated. Um, so just to put that, and NASWA's recycling program is relatively new. Yes. So how many years, how long have you been operating the facility now, Ray? Nine years. You've been operating for nine years. And when did you start? Myself, yes. Mm -hmm. And when did you start collecting glass? Uh, two years ago. Two years ago. And now you have 12 people bringing in glass. Yes. So do people have other ways of recycling or taking care of their trash rather than coming into your facility? No, but they put everything in black bags and everything goes in the, in the household garbage. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's why we, we, we need to uh, educate the public and see what we can do a little further on here. Mm -hmm. So, and why do you think um, people were interested in having the glass recycling at your facility? People weren't even thinking about that till John started it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the containers we have, we, men when we mentioned the glass, some people throw some in anyway, in the regular trash. And we're still trying to advertise a little bit more. But like I say, we need better signing and uh, just one spot for glass, one spot for something else and all that. Mm -hmm. it, we're really just starting. Right, right. 
So some of the ways that we had worked with these two regional recycling facilities to get the word out is by writing a press release uh, for both for both centers and um, that getting distributed, but also reaching out to a um, radio station within the state who by chance I found one that was interested in talking about glass recycling. And she did um, feature stories about both of these areas. Um, another idea that came out for NASWA um, with John, who is uh, Ray's boss, he's the town manager for Eagle Lake. Um, he uh, had an idea of offering lottery ticket, a lottery ticket to every resident who would bring in glass as a way to entice people to start recycling the product. Yes, Michael, sir. I'm just wondering if you had any uh, any other strategies or ways to entice people to bring in the glass when they come in? Not uh, off the top of my head, it's, I mean, for us, it was, people were itching, you know, when, when we got our ones, three through seven plastics cut off, we encouraged people to go to glass because at the time we were able to get rid of the glass so when we started taking plastic, you know, I don't know that people switched off from glass, but every, it was just everybody wants to recycle it. And, and we, we were telling people for a while that we are working on getting glass back. And, and we, we had, even when we got rid, we couldn't accept the plastics. We had people that if they had the space, they were, they were saving all those products, the ones three through sevens on their own, so that when, if and when we did start accepting again, they, they were able to bring it in. And they were, we were looking at one to three years worth of their plastics. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got to, we got to educate the public that's around here. Most people that are recycling, they're out of staters because they're used to it. Oh. And uh, we got to train this, this population of around here, the the public here, to do the same. You, you may want to go to the schools and start a recycling program in the school so that the kids go home, and you know they're they're taught they're talking about the recycling program. Yes, I got all this done. What you're saying here, but that'll be mentioned to John and see what he says. And probably go press relief and the radio and the schools and see what we can do. Mm -hmm. So one of the um, one of the the points to uh, collecting glass is knowing who your end markets are, right? So Michael talked a lot about this company who is uh, able to use crushed glass, who is uh, would be considered a local market as well as the possibility of uh, area contractors using the glass uh, for fill. Um, and Michael, I don't know if you mentioned it about Mafka or not, but can you talk about that a little bit? In regards to? Their interest in the possibility of using the glass for fill on their organic farms. Well, Mafka, Maine Organic Farmers Gardeners Association, they, they have talked about possibly wanting some of our crushed glass just for fill on their property so that they're not having to, you know, purchase other dirts, you know, just it's reusing something that's available and helping to reduce the, their carbon footprint. You, uh, use that, you use that for fill, but you have to put a little gravel over it, yeah? Yeah, I mean, if, if you, you know, when they, they have over 60,000 people coming out to the fair, and if they have holes on, 
holes on the property, they can fill the hole mostly with some crushed glass and they'd be able to throw some topsoil over the top for the grass to grow. Now, and the DEP doesn't mind that or? It's considered inert fill, so there's there's no problem there. There essentially is no problem with it. Good. That's a good idea, though. Well, well it's not inert fill. It's, it's considered an inert matter. So it, it's... You're not as concerned with silica dust. Right. You're not concerned with it. Yeah. Well, that sounds good. A lot of good ideas here. I'll mention to John. So one of the things that uh, we've talked about it with the NASWAS program is that since they're close to the Canadian border and there are manufacturers using recycled glass in Canada, um, we've identified two potential companies um, for them to possibly ship their glass to. Um, some of the concerns around shipping whole bottles or broken bottles is the cost of transportation. Yes. So, um, so you have to weigh the benefits of the avoided waste cost compared to the cost of transportation. Um, and uh, the cost of waste, if the glass doesn't have a lot of contaminants, meaning plastics or metals, um, they want it, you know, caps off, corks out kind of thing. Um, if they get clean glass, the cost for shipping would be less than a uh, landfill tipping fee. Right. Um, but if it is rejected once it arrives at one of those facilities, the cost to dispose of that load will be charged to the town. So it's just there's a great need for keeping the glass clean at all stages when right. uh, we're talking about an end manufacturer, a manufacturer creating new products from it, like glass containers or fiberglass. So the glass containers and fiberglass in markets are available um, through these outlets in Canada. So that's why it made sense when we were uh, initially talking with NASWA for them to collect whole bottles uh, or broken glass from containers uh, for no, those markets. For the shipping, right? Right, because the shipping costs are less for you. Now, where Michael is, he's further down in the state. So that's why uh, he's further away from those markets. And that uh, at the time we initially were talking, that didn't seem to make much sense where the crushed glass and this new company coming in um, seemed to be the better way to go. So I point yeah. that out because in the chat, there's been a lot of back and forth about end markets. Um, and that was one of our first discussion points held with both of these groups is what would be potential end markets. So that requires, first of all, we went on to Glass Packaging Institute's website. They have a map of the, of, um, the US and Canada and it shows the various glass processors and manufacturers uh, locations on those maps. So you can see the proximity to where you're located. Um, we also explored the possibility of using the uh, NRRAs. Uh, it's a New Hampshire nonprofit who is collecting their, they've manage a collection program in a sense where they work with towns in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Vermont to uh, have the towns collect clean glass. And then there's other glass. So the clean glass is getting, they have aggregation points, and then they send that glass up to Canada for processing to go to a manufacturer. The uh, other glass has plate glass and ceramics mixed in, and that gets used for a process glass aggregate program. 
So we looked at all these various options for these two areas. Um, and those are, that's kind of where you have to start it by looking at your end markets. The tricky part is the end market changes, right? So a facility that may have been accepting crushed glass may now only be accepting whole glass or, or broken glass. So you've got to keep in communication with all of these end markets. Yeah. Uh, it also affects decision making around buying equipment that you might use, like the crusher. When yeah. Michael's group bought that crusher machine, it seemed like it would work. But I think that they've become so successful at getting a lot of volume of glass, if they've outgrown the machine much quicker than they thought that they would, um, which is a great thing but it also places a burden on them now to figure out how to move to the next step. Um, so there, it's definitely a moving target. It's not something that you figure out today and the answers are gonna be the same a couple months from now or a year from now. It's something that you have to work at continuously. Um, and I'll, stop talking there and see if Michael or Ray want to add anything to that. Now, shipping whole wouldn't be any good for us. We got to pay the freight, you know. Yeah. He needs to buy a crusher or something. Well, oh. and, and um, Michael and I were talking too, because uh, the end, the, the manu the companies who are processing the glass for end manufacturers want a full truckload. So that's 32 tons. Now yeah. that's either 32 tons of crushed glass or 32 tons of whole glass. Um, so it's the same amount uh, for, the, for the shipping, um, but you can get more glass. Well, I don't know how many bottles goes into 32 tons of crushed glass. Michael, do you know that? No, I do not. I don't oh, either. Yes, yeah, so that obviously the whole bottles take up more space um, and also uh, create an issue with storage, right? Until you get that 32 tons. Now in some states, they may have local outlets for um, smaller amounts of glass. In Maine, unfortunately, uh, in the locations where these two facilities are at, their only options are for the larger amounts of glass. If they lived closer, if they were located closer to Portland, Maine, there's a um, materials recovery facility who would accept whole bottle glass and possibly crushed glass, um, but you have to be close enough to that facility to make to have it make sense. Yes. In our facility, we also offer non-resident memberships and we have people that drive as far as two hours away. They pay $30 a year and drive two hours just to use our facility. Because and it takes so much. Because we accept so much product. It, mm -hmm. You know, when, when it's coming... I understand it costs money for recycling, but it also costs money to get rid of your solid waste. And if, and if people can, if you can make something new or just use it one more time, it seems that it would make much more sense to use it again versus just throwing it in a landfill yeah. and leaving it for someone else. Right. Well, so, okay, I'll be talking with John. And <laughs> so I wanted to go through some of the questions that have come through the chat and please uh, keep, keep posting your questions. Um, we, there was a lot of questions around the glass crusher. And uh, Michael, do you know how long it takes to crush a bottle? Uh, just a couple seconds. In, in our machine, it's only take, it just takes a couple seconds. It drops in and as the machine's turned on, it's right up to speed and just 
just a matter of a moment, you know, in a moment's time and that they're probably crushing one bottle every five to six seconds as mm-hmm. far as putting the glass in and letting the machine come right back up to speed before they're putting a second bottle in. So you, you can't you can't just throw in as fast as you want because it's going to stop. Correct. It slows down. Yeah. And and it can clog the machine. Yeah. So clog, I, uh, yeah. I'm just going to point out, see where where I have my cursor on the screen where this gentleman's hand is. That is the chute where you put the bottle in. And then yeah. it goes down into here, crushes, and then enters the bucket at the bottom. Right. Um, one, one thing I do want to put uh, just mention is that the machine does create a puff of powder smoke, I call it. I don't know what how a dust. Oh, it does. Huh? Yeah, per bottle. So that's the reason for the fan, because you don't want staff to be breathing in any of the silica dust. No, that's well, pretty I, I don't know that it's a silica dust, but it's it's any type of glass dust. I wouldn't want to necessarily be breathing it in. Yeah. No. That thank you, Michael, uh, for clarifying that. And if you notice, their their staff is using a um, he's got both a face shield plus um, a mask on to make sure that he's not breathing in any of that dust. Um, plus his ear protection, and he's got safe, uh, glasses on as well. So he's well equipped and the cut proof gloves uh, is well equipped for running this machine. The other thing I was so impressed by was his record keeping. So if you see this uh, clipboard up here, he, he keeps a log of how many bottles he's crushing and for how many hours he has been using the machine so that he can estimate when he might need to replace items on the machine or when he can expect to do something else. Michael, can you talk a little bit about about that? Yeah, some of the, we, we felt that some of the screens weren't lasting like they said they were supposed to. So the company, we've kept track our last screen of the original type we kept track of how many bottles we put through so that when we got they sent us a thicker screen that was supposed to last longer and they're currently keeping track of how many bottles they they're putting through that that screen so that we can give them some feedback as to whether or not it lasts longer yeah as far as that silica, I wouldn't want to breed that in either. So. Yeah. Well, it, it it's not so much that it's silica, it but it is still glass, and to have glass, it's, like, it's probably work like asbestos on the lungs. <laughs> well, and I want to mention that NRRA's program, they do all their glass crushing outside, completely outside. Yeah. away from uh, any residents uh, to make sure that the staff and people in the area are not breathing in that dust as they are crushing the glass. Um, can you talk about the labels, Michael? Is that a concern at all? We have no concern over the labels. The only thing we require is that it's clean and you take the lid off, the, any rings off and no cork. So we only put glass through this machine. Now that's what we've been doing though. The label, uh, the lids are off and everything. Mm-hmm. So there is no other than the crushed glass that comes out of your machine. There right. is no other residue that comes out. That's right. it. Not recognizable. I mean, the, the glue that's on the glass from the label and, and the label is in there, but they, they do, there is, there are ways to separate that. The comp- this particular manufacturer, I know they have a sorting machine that will do different grades of, of sorting. And I'm not sure that it, it takes out the paper or not, but I suspect it does. Yeah. 
They, they must because the paper's staying on there as far as what we're doing. Well, I, I also, I can't remember her name. You, you had me in a meeting whether she was from Oregon or Washington State. Yes, Suzanne. Mm -hmm. I believe that they have a slightly larger unit than what we have from the same manufacturer. And I believe they require their people to remove the labels and clean the glue off as well. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yep. But they they don't do it at a town level. They do it. It's I don't know that you'd call it a club, but it's more of a club service than than a, a municipality doing it. Yeah. Well, as far as the budget goes here, we'd have to do that on working hours and there's no way we can do that. We're, we're busy with everything else. And right, John's, but, John's budget is small and I don't think he'd let us put in hours to do that. No, it, it's, it's required. It, the label removal is required before the product is dropped off. It, it's not the, it's not the glass crushers that are doing the cleaning. It, it's, it's if you want to use our program, you have to um, have it clean or they don't accept it. And, and pe regular people don't just drop off the bottles at their facility. They have what they call glass ambassadors. And you have to contact an ambassador to have your glass picked up. Okay. I'm just going through the um, through the questions here. One is uh, someone asked if Maine is a bottle built state, and what happens to that glass compared to the glass collected at municipal programs? Do either one of you want to take a stab at that? No, I don't know. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't even begin to dare to say where the glass goes. Yeah. Um, so yes, Maine, Maine is a bottle bill state. I, I know a little bit about it. Um, there are companies that deal only with bottle bill glass. So they literally uh, are operating the reverse vendor, vending machines or um, the glass from redemption centers they pick up. They, their glass is considered the cleanest glass because it never touches any other uh, glass materials um, because they are being collected completely separate from everything else. Um, and they go directly to beneficiators to clean it up and to get it into a form that manufacturers can use, and then they send it off. As soon as glass goes to any recycling market, uh, recycling facility, uh, or a transfer station as what exists in these two regions in Maine, um, it gets a bad reputation, even if it is separated. And even only if clean containers are accepted without the caps and the, and the lids on them. Um, to the point where uh, the same companies dealing with bottle bill glass will not deal <clears throat> with the glass coming from these facilities. So it makes it a lot harder for the facilities to deal with the glass on their own. Well, it sounds like we're too far from anything without pay shipping. Yep, and that's why uh, NASWA's outlet Ray is most, I would say, advantageous outlet is up in Canada. Yeah. So you really have part, you know you know what part of Canada? Yeah. Um, there's a um, company that accepts separated glass, source separated glass, uh, from transfer stations in Moncton. And then there is also a beneficiator in Montreal who also has a facility in Hopedale, Mass. What's the name of the second one? 2M Resources. 2M. Um, uh, 
And I wanted to ask you, Ray, because I'm not sure you mentioned it. How does the glass recycling program get paid for? Is it through tax through the tax base or how do residents pay for that service? How do the residents pay? Pay. Taxes. Through the taxes also. Okay. Yeah. I have no more questions. Yeah. Um, well, we have 15 minutes left for this discussion. Uh, I think this is, um, we have a lot of people on the line who are very interested in glass recycling. And we have these, our two presenters today who have shared their stories about their experience with collecting glass and working with the public, getting the word out, um, educating residents as they come into the facility, and especially with minimal staff to try and um, you know, direct them to recycle the glass in the right location and to make sure the containers are clean. Um, and uh, really provide the uh, viewpoint of what it takes to recycle glass in rural areas um, where markets are few and their decision-making process around what form of glass they are going to recycle and uh, how they're going to handle all that. Um, just checking our questions one last time. Um, no Michael, question. you said you collect the fluorescent bulbs and what happens to those? We, we receive boxes by either FedEx or UPS, and we have to, there's specific boxes for each type of bulb. And there, there is a packaging process. They're in a at least one plastic bag and it has to be taped off properly. Um, and what company are you sending them to? Veolia. Veolia, okay. We just had a business from Waterville, which is about 20 miles from us. They want to bring us close to 300 fluorescent tanning bed bulbs. This is what we're doing now. We're botching them with the plastic and sealing them and taping the ends. And then UPS picks them up. And where do you send them? They go down, down out of state somewhere. And, and what are you all doing with uh, plate glass? We're not plate doing glass. anything with plate glass. Are you? No, we're, right? we're throwing it away. So you're not using it for processed glass aggregate? No. Okay. All right, all right, let's just- It go. just goes in the regular, regular garbage, but you gotta break it up. Oh, here's a question. Um, do you know how much your, uh, the tonnage of your municipal solid waste stream has been reduced by the, as a result of your glass recycling efforts? Not off the top. I, I, could, I, don't I, I couldn't that. answer that because uh, John keeps track of that. I couldn't answer that. Okay. And how about you, Michael? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. I haven't done the... Sometimes the town office takes care of the solid waste report. I've done it a couple times. And, and I'm not exactly certain if, if it's even been noticeable. But you did say that you have a ton and a half waiting to be crushed and how many tons you've already crushed? We've crushed 16 tons. And Ray, what would you estimate the amount of glass that you've diverted so far? About two tons, two and a half tons. Okay. 
that we could. And what is your tip, your uh, MSW tipping fee for both of your areas? I wouldn't even begin to know. No, the trash fee, you don't? No, I, I, I don't. I haven't gotten into that part. The, the selectmen in the town office deal with that side and I only um, deal with the recycling center. Okay. And how about you, Ray? Do you know for your for Eagle Lake area what the cost of trash per ton is? I don't know the, uh, the cost of trash per ton, but I know for hauling is uh, $550 a load. Just for the hauling? Yep. Mm -hmm. And we started collecting glass. Uh, I see John's notes here. Twelve months ago, he says. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, I believe, unless I see um, any other questions that haven't, I, I believe we've gone through all of the questions that have come in. Um, I see a lot of people who are on this webinar have answered some of the questions, so we didn't have a need to go to go through it again. But we'll just give it another uh, few seconds to see if anybody has any last minute questions before we stop. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get John. He's been mentioning it, but it hasn't happened to get some scratch tickets for the people bringing the that in there. I'm going to mention back that back to him. Yeah, I, I think to huh? see. Yeah, we were thinking something to entice people. Right. You know, <laughs> something yeah. to entice people. Yeah, get them out of their houses. And um, when we were talking, John thought the, a lottery ticket might might do it. Yes. We'll we'll see what happens, but. I think they have to have a little amount before we give them a lottery ticket. Yeah, right. You can decide <laughs> that one. Jar, not one jar. <laughs> um, so a question come, came in, are there funds available for private companies that can divert significant amounts of glass from the waste stream? Um, I'm not sure if main DEPs, I mean, it would depend on what state you're in. Some yeah. states definitely have uh, what are called recycling market development grants. Other states don't. Um, for this project in Maine, both of these regions have gotten grants from the state. I don't know if they are applicable for businesses though. Do you know? Do either one of you know? No. I'm not aware of anything. Yeah, and Megan Pryor, I don't know if you're on uh, the webinar still, but if you are, if you could unmute yourself and just let us know if that's applicable for Maine. And so Megan may not be still on, but we have some people put Massachusetts has funds, Minnesota has grant funds. Um, so it would be worth it, whether you are a municipality or a business to contact um, the environmental agency within your state to find out if funds exist uh, to help you further develop or to develop glass recycling. Uh, programs. Nebraska is another uh, state that has grass, grant funds. I know Pennsylvania has a recycling market center. They may have access to funds as well. Um, so it just takes a little bit of research to find that information. Okay. Yeah. We'll see All what right. We can do here. Well, I think uh, we have come to the end of our webinar. I want to thank both Ray and Michael for sharing your experiences with us and thank everyone who has been on the webinar. We will be, uh, the recording uh, will be available 
probably by tomorrow, but I will email everyone to let you know what the link is to that. And I thank you all for participating in today's webinar and have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day. All righty. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Sure.